This is the problem. This is the problem that uh, the software is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. It's in every device. It's in every piece of infrastructure and in every component in every device. And we don't hear much about that software because it's opaque, it's obscure, and, uh, um, you know, but like any other software, whether it's an application or a software inside a network device or IoT device, it's vulnerable. That's right. Yeah, it seems like this, um, for example, a laptop that we have today, it seems like it's like an entirely black box in terms of the different components that are on the, uh, in the laptop, right? So we're talking about many different suppliers, million of code that's running each of these pieces of component. And so there's potentially a very, very big attack surface that we're talking about. Not only it's a black box, but it's also an extremely complex black mm. box. When I, you know, I use an example that a typical PC is, uh, is built by over 265 suppliers. And each company, each supplier is building those components in a PC That's and right. developing code that runs in those components. Yeah, exactly. And also the suppliers, the different suppliers, each one goes through like a very, very long supply chain. So from the design phase to the, I guess, the manufacturing, the deployment, the transportation, distribution. So at each stage, there's the potential for a malicious actor to inject some of this malicious code. It's a wild west. It's, it's a, a wild, wild west. west. Okay. At any point in the supply chain, at any uh, any of the uh, uh, of those links in the supply chain, a uh, a compromise may happen. But supply chain risk is way more than that. Even if the compromise hasn't happened in any of those suppliers, which is a tall order, you know, which is a uh, uh, very unlikely scenario with uh, today's complexity of the supply chain, but. All of these vulnerable, all of these components, and all of the code that is uh, developed by those uh, suppliers and vendors has vulnerabilities. So even if it's okay now, mm -hmm. but you know when we bought that laptop or a computer or yeah. a piece of network device or or, or smart device, right. then three months from now it can be compromised because of one of those vulnerabilities. Yes. CPU, when we talk about CPU, is not a monolithic component. Mm -hmm. It has multiple microcontrollers running multiple types of operating systems and, and firmware and microcode and software inside the CPU, and all of that has vulnerabilities. So these vulnerabilities you mentioned in uh, uh, Spectrum L down, uh, as well as uh, you know all those types of uh, sp speculative or chance and execution vulnerabilities, it's only one class of vulnerability that affects that particular component, the, uh, the, the, the processor, microprocessor. Mm -hmm. But in majority of the cases, those components that run inside critical devices, they run regular software. Maybe Linux-based OS, maybe uh, some kind of real-time operating system, maybe some kind of other software, um, um, uh, software architecture. Uh, and as a result, majority of those vulnerabilities are simple software bugs. Mm -hmm. that are being exploited for many years now in user applications and are now being exploited inside devices. Because uh, the other problem is that all of these components typically don't have modern exploit mitigation, mitigations that applications already introduced years ago. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question about the UEFI, UEFI is one, only one type of architecture for that device type of uh, mm -hmm. software or firmware. That's right. Uh, unified extensible firmware um, um, architecture, firmware interface, uh, that was um, started to being adopted um, by modern IT systems about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now majority of the IT equipment um, um, follows that architecture and the, and the system firmware runs um, that is UEFI. So it's about 10 UFI. years now, right? Uh, about 10 years, yes. Right, okay. So most of the systems are running uh, the, that type of system firmware. And it's just one type of firmware. Mm -hmm. the, the amount of vulnerabilities it has it allows or enables adversaries to uh, compromise PCs, servers, network yeah. gear, and other type of equipment, uh, both remotely and use those systems as initial access vector, but also install persistent malware. That's right, yeah. Malware that is you cannot get rid of that malware by reinstalling operating system or re-imaging the hard drive or even replacing the hard drive because those type of, uh, those, that type of malware, mm -hmm. those type of implants or backdoors are in the firmware that is in the motherboard. Of That's right, yeah. yeah. So you talk about Black Lotus as one example of this uh, latest uh, discovered uh, 
vulnerability or exploit? It's a, it's a threat in the wild. So can you tell us how more advanced is Black Lotus compared to the other sort of earlier versions? Why is, you know, compromising firmware so attractive for threat actors? Uh, multiple reasons. One is that nobody will detect you there, find, find you there. Because we've evolved our uh, uh, detection and protection controls at the software application level, yeah. at the operating system and above, right. we have a lot of those controls. Security controls, including you know, detecting uh, indicators of compromise mm -hmm. and malware uh, and, and so on and so forth. But uh, there are no controls, nobody's looking at that level. So uh, once you compromise um, you know, that software inside device or a firmware inside device, then you're essentially staying there hidden for months or years. And we've seen those examples when uh, threat actors stay in the infrastructure uh, um, uh, for, for, for a very long time. And uh, um, the, other, the other part is that staying persistent. Persistent meaning that even other measures will not mm -hmm. get rid of that malware or, or those threats, including reimaging those, uh, those systems, sense and response. Um, uh, but the other reason is exploiting vulnerabilities in firmware is simple. One of the misconceptions that we faced in the last few years is mm -hmm. that exploiting firmware is complicated. Yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. The reality is that it takes in often, ca often case that those vulnerabilities are extremely simple uh, in you know in a, in a functionality that may be parsing some network traffic or, or you know JSON formats or mm -hmm. something like that those are extremely simple software vulnerabilities that uh, also are not protected by exploit mitigation techniques so for most of the threat actors that are looking for easy way uh, way into uh, the infrastructure they found that exploiting those vulnerabilities in in, in the firmware of devices is much simpler than developing a very complicated exploit chain uh, in addition to that, once you're in firmware, not only you are hidden and persistent, but you also have high level of privilege. Exactly, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, you, can, you can damage the phys uh, system physically. You have full access uh, to the data on that mm -hmm. system. You have a full access to the entire mm -hmm. software stack mm -hmm. on that system. Uh, pretty much everything. I, uh, I, you know, to give you an example, a, 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 a firmware on a server um, if, if it's compromised, then it has access to all of the workloads, all of the virtual machines with all of the data exactly. running in that that's server. Right. Exactly, yeah, that's right, yeah. What would your advice be for, you know, organizations who are worried about uh, the security posture when it comes to their firmware? Well, I, I, I think, um, I think we, we have a very significant supply chain problem in our infrastructure, regardless of what that infrastructure is. Um, PC or server infrastructure, network infrastructure, IoT or OT infrastructure, cloud infrastructure. Mm -hmm. All of that depends on a lot of external products and external, yeah. external hardware, devices, mm -hmm. as well as software products. So we need to build a plan to understand and verify what those products are made okay. of and what risk they bring to us. We need to understand which vulnerabilities we inherit by buying in and introducing those technologies and devices in our infrastructure, and then devise uh, some kind of a, a mitigation plan um, uh, for those vulnerabilities. And we also need to, we need to constantly look, has anything changed? Has anything changed in that uh, device? that critical server or a network load balancer or has anything changed in that software product that we've been using for the last few months uh, to monitor and discover threat actors that might have compromised it uh, in operations. So do an inventory assessment of their firmware, which is kind of difficult given there's not a lot of software bill materials for firmware, is there? Oh, there's definitely uh, there's definitely uh, build materials for hardware, for firmware, uh, as as well as for software. So I would say that the first practical steps are to introduce intelligence and um, an assessment of the critical equipment, critical uh, technologies that would provide you know a visibility into vulnerabilities, visibility into build of materials, uh, as well as the integrity measurement, uh, integrity uh, monitoring. Thank you.